actually, this talk is supposed to be more, more of a discussion uh, to get ideas. And actually, what I forgot to get, unless someone else wants to, uh, Kate, maybe you can. If you have a pen and paper or something, just write, take notes. <laughs> um, I picked you because I knew you were the most reliable on that. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I know everyone else here is even less reliable. <laughs> OK, so um, first off, I think a lot of people would probably already know what F-trace is. Um, should I say, who doesn't know what F-trace is? Or have you ever heard of F-trace? So everyone here, yeah. Uh, so everyone knows what F-trace is. So uh, the first talk is just to go quickly through um, what F-trace currently does, because this talk is supposed to be about, or discussion is about, what it should do, or what actually what you'd like it to do. Uh, but to know what you'd like it to do, you have to kind of know all the little things about what it currently does, because a lot of times um, I will talk about F-Trace, and a lot of people that's been using it for almost as long as it's been around were like, oh, I didn't know it could do that. And I'm trying to go through a generalization of everything F-Trace can do. Uh, and here's the topics I'll talk with. I'm going to step through them one at a time. Starting with the most powerful aspect of F-trace, and that's the function tracer. Um, it's very powerful because you actually can see everything that's happening within the kernel. Uh, it uses, a lot of people uh, don't realize this, or maybe they do, uh, that it has a dynamic modification of the code to keep the um, overhead down. Um, <clears throat> So that it's mostly no ops. We have like little plugs inside the each function by the um, GCC dash PG. Uh, oh God, <laughs> I don't want to know. But dash PG um, uh, option that puts in an M count call or F entry. I'm not going to go into the details there. And then at boot up, we turn them all to no ops. And when you want to turn on function tracing, it changes those no ops dynamically into um, calls to tracing. This is also how uh, live kernel patching works. Uh, it uses the F-trace infrastructure to hijack uh, functions to replace them with a patched function uh, for uh, live updates. One of the, uh, starting off, the easiest thing to know is uh, because it does dynamic tracing, um, it's ideally, you don't want to, maybe you don't want to trace everything because when you enable function tracing, uh, it adds quite a lot of overhead. And a lot of times what I, what's nice to do is just to pick a few functions that you want to see how they work. So the set ftrace filter is what you would echo the function name in. And um, it, only those functions that you uh, specify will be traced. Uh, there's also the set ftrace no trace, which is nice if you um, enable all functions, but you just don't want to trace some functions. Like a lot of times, I don't want to trace uh, the spin locks because uh, spin locks have more overhead uh, when you're tracing them, so, or I'll start um, doing a trace and there's a lot of functions I don't care about, so I'll throw them into the no trace because uh, no trace takes precedence over the trace side. So if you have a function in both no trace and trace, it won't be traced. Um, so to keep the overhead down in no trace is to make, get rid of the stuff that shows up a lot that you don't care about. Now the also it's new, sort of new is the set ftrace PID if you only want to trace a certain process. Um, you enable, or you throw in the PID for that process into set ftrace, and that process will be traced and nothing else will be traced. Still, everything else has the overhead because all the functions are still hitting the trace, but you just, your, trace will, your trace data, your ring buffer, will only contain the data for your functions. Um, sort of new is the uh, option. Uh, if you echo one into the options of function fork, any P um, if a process's PID is in the F-trace, set ftrace PID and that process forks, it will add that the child of that process to the set ftrace PID. And when the process exits, that PID will disappear as well. So you only trace, if you want to trace not just the process, but all the threads and everything or anything that it makes, um, by setting the function fork, it will create all the, or trace everything you expect it to. One of the also small or not very well known uh, features of ftrace is the trigger uh, file uh, where you could actually or uh, write into the actually the set ftrace filter there's a way to put triggers on the functions where you could say I want this function to do a stack trace. So if you want to say let's say you want to see where all the um, 
where everything gets scheduled, you want to stack trace on all schedule, you can actually put a trigger on the schedule function and the trace will record, do a stack trace and record all, um, every time a schedule happens so you can see what's, why, this, why your process is scheduled out. Oh. Uh, snapshot uh, is a feature um, where I, I talk a little bit about this, where you have two different buffers, kind of like where the latency traces work. You have a separate, separate buffer that when a uh, function hits a snapshot trigger, it will swap the main buffer with uh, the buffer that's a static buffer. Okay, so the static buffer doesn't change unless it gets swapped into the dynamic buffer that gets up, constantly gets updated. So uh, you're tracing along, and then say if you hit a function that you said, okay, this function it seldom gets hit. Anytime it hits this, I want it to, um, I want to save the trace. So when it hits snapshot, it does a swap of the buffers, and the SAG buffer, you can look at it any time later, so it doesn't, you don't lose the data from tracing going on. Um, you could turn off tracing and turn on tracing. Actually, I've never needed the trace on function tracer. I think, well, maybe I used it once. But trace off trigger is really nice because if you know there's a, um, if you're trying to debug something, on a kernel that you can't modify or touch, and you know uh, you're hitting some sort of bug and you want to see everything up to that point, and you know that a function that is in the, the bug path, that's not normally called unless you hit a bug, you could actually put a trigger on that function that gets called and say, turn off tracing here. So as soon as you hit your bug, tracing stops, and then you get to see everything without worrying about everything uh, being lost by overflow of the buffer. Trace off and warning, right? Hmm? Trace off and warning. Yes. You've got this yeah, there's a trace, yeah, actually, I should have put that in there. <laughs> That's, see, there's a feature that I've added that I forgot about. There's actually a flag that you can say trace off on warning. So if you actually hit a warning, uh, tracing turns off. It's actually, I think it's just, um, I don't know if it's in the proc file system or is it in the... I forever forget. Yeah, oh, yeah. Tra yeah, I gotta put it back, I gotta put everything into the tracing directory. That's one of my to-do lists. Yeah, this is the one option I always use. Yeah, so if you hit, so you're tracing, you can actually set a flag so if you hit a warning, tracing stops. So you don't lose uh, the data that you're looking for. Uh, you can also enable and disable events by, if you hit a function, enable events. Uh, that's people been asked about. I never actually used that. Maybe I did once. Um, there's a profiler that, if you want to just see how many times a function gets hit, there's a profiler, but Perf could do that as well. Um, there's a stack tracer that every function, it looks at the stack to see how big the stack is, and every time it hits a max stack level, it will say, okay, record uh, the stack. Um, it does a stack trace kind of, of every time it hits a new max. So you actually, and it tells you how much each function, how much overhead each function actually has. Um, after I uh, did this, or submitted this, um, I was CC'd on a private email from Linus uh, saying, hey, I see this new stack feature in here, and I ran it, and you guys here suck. <laughs> so I was like, hey, but he didn't, he, didn't put that, he didn't do it on the mailing list. He just did that, and he CC'd me. I was like, that's kind of cool. Um, I won't say who he was talking to either. Uh, the nice, another nice um, tracer is the function graph tracer. If you haven't used that, that's one I think is the most uh, impressive of the tracing utilities because it gives, when you look at the trace, uh, you can see what's happening inside the kernel. And it looks like C code. I mean, it's made to do the curly brackets and indentation. Um, so you see the paths of all the functions. Um, so the indent, or yeah, you can see the calling graph of what function calls what function. And also does a timestamp as well. So not only does it record what function calls what function, it tells you how long that function ran because it traces not only the entry of the function, but also the exit of the function. Um, because of the overhead, function graph tracer is a very expensive um, uh, function tracer, or is a very expensive tracer that if you have a really deep call graph, don't, don't be too um, worried about high numbers of uh, latency or how like this function took so long to run if it had a deep call graph because the function graph tracer's overhead is going to definitely skew that. Uh, so if you're interested in, if you see something that looks really big and you're worried about it, you use the set ftrace filters, which work with the function graph tracer. Turn off, or just trace the one function you're worried about, and that gives you a much more accurate reading of how long that function actually lasted. So I say if you ever just run function graph tracer and you see something you don't like, just filter that one function, run the function graph tracer, and it gives you a nice accurate uh, how long that function actually took. Uh, the max def, depth is, I wrote this, or I added this, um, I don't usually do much more than max depth of one. <laughs> Uh, what this does is when the function graph tracer goes on, it will only go uh, trace the depth of 
what you say in here. So we say a max depth of one, the first time it actually enters the kernel, it's going to trace that function and nothing else. The uh, reason why I did this was for the no hertz code. Uh, ideally, no hertz is you don't, I want to see what is actually, if I have a user space spinning, and I want to make sure that this guy could run and doesn't get interrupted at all by the kernel, I run this guy, run this, and I can see any time that function or that process goes into the kernel, and I only, I only care about the first entry point. I don't care about anything else. Um, but it's also actually, a, some people say it's kind of a um, uh, more high end uh, or more powerful, um, what's it called, S trace, because it shows you page faults and such like that. So when your function or your process takes a page fault, you see that where S trace doesn't. Um, yeah, I already said about single functions and. Yeah, and if you run the profiler with function graph tracing, it gives you not only the number of hit count, but also does the time stamps of how long functions were. But again, it could be skewed. Uh, I mentioned the snapshot. There's actually a snapshot file in there, so at any time, your user process, if you want to trace something and just take snapshots from the user process because of something that happens, you actually uh, write into the snapshot file. And then if you ever forget how to use a snapshot file, uh, you just cat snapshot file, and actually, if, if it's not enabled, it gives you the directions on how to use it. Because personally, I forget how to use it, and I put this in just to remind me. So if you just, uh, documentation inside the kernel. Um, and that's actually a cut and paste from what it actually says on how to run it. And again, it swaps the main buffer with the snapshot buffer. Uh, trace events, there's thousands of them today, and I'm sure if you've used Ftrace, you use trace events. There's stuff for scheduling, interrupts, timers, um, things for hypervisors and everything else that's up there. Um, <clears throat> there's also a set event PID, so you could say, I only want to trace uh, this certain task. And there's also the options event fork. So if you're interested in tracing uh, not just the tasks that you put into the set event pay ID, but also any of the forks that it does. Now this is a different utility than the F trace utility or the function tracing utility. Uh, they're separate utilities. So if you want to, if you're running function graph tracer or function tracing or function graph tracer, and you're running um, events and you want to trace the PIDs, you got to put your PID in both files and set both options if you want the children done. So they're separate entities. Uh, don't think you'll, if you set this, the uh, function tracing will follow. Um, events have triggers as well. And there's the snapshot trigger, the same thing I mentioned with the function tracing. You could trace off on, uh, this is for events. So if you hit this event, you could do this. And, um, uh, you can enable and disable other events. And there's histograms, which I'm going to talk a little bit about later. Uh, what's nice about uh, event triggers is you also could put a filter on it. So you actually, after you say, like, say if I want a snapshot only on this task when it hits this. I only care about if I do scheduling, if I set the snapshot trigger on the scheduler, I could actually put a filter in there to say, you know, snapshot if com equals cyclic test. Uh, and that means that every time um, the scheduler happens, it will look to see if it was cyclic test that was running, and it will only do the snapshot if it was uh, or a stack trace, um, that's probably more efficient. A stack trace on every schedule if it's cyclic test. Uh, there's latency tracers. Um, for there's the interrupts uh, latency tracer, uh, preempt latency tracer, and uh, the most common is the uh, IRQ preempt latency tracer, which is does both preemption and um, uh, interrupts disabled. So. If you have the case where you do local IRQ save, preempt disable, local IRQ enable, preempt enable, uh, it'll record the outer too. We could start at the uh, uh, IRQ disable to the preempt enable. Uh, so it kind of mixes both. So you can see how long, uh, what's the worst place where you have scheduling latencies possible. And it will keep, it'll record everything and every time it hits a new max, it will uh, re do a snapshot of it. So these latency tracers actually are just snaps or magical snapshot uh, tools. Uh, the wake-up tracer, there's three, four, three wake-up uh, tracers. The, if you just say, I just want to run the wake-up tracer, it will uh, look for the highest priority task running, whether it's the highest prior nice task, and it will just, when a wake-up happens, it'll record the time until it gets scheduled in. If a higher priority process comes in there, it says, okay, ignore the one I'm tracing now, let's, well, let's look at that guy. So when something is preempted by a higher priority task, it says, oh, this is normal, forget what we're doing, let's keep tracing. 
uh, if you use wake up RT, it only cares about real time tasks, and if you use wake up DL, it only cares about deadline tasks. Uh, both of these are static tracers, which means that they can't do much to modify them. Um, they are what they are, and um, it's kind of hard to do things like if you just care about a single task and run it on a single task. If you want to do debugging of your kernel, um, trace print K is like the major thing that I would suggest to use. Uh, it's like print K, but it writes to the ring buffer, and it doesn't have the problems of print K that I will be talking about at uh, the Embedded Linux Conference and Open Source Summit, uh, both places and Kernel Summit, uh, the problems with print K, because print K can't always be done in the scheduler, it can't be done, at, you know, it's where if you do it in interrupts, it, it could cause problems. Trace print K is extremely fast, and it can be done in any context, NMI context, um, scheduler. Uh, the only thing you can't really use print, trace print K to for is they actually, if you throw it into the actual ftrace ring buffer, because then it sort of has problems. Although I think it might now work. I think I do have recursion protection there that it'll actually, you could actually maybe do a trace print K within the uh, um, ring buffer. Uh, I haven't tried it since I added the recursion protection. Uh, ftrace sump on oops is a great utility. I use it a lot. I'm, I know uh, Thomas uses it. Uh, Peter, you probably use it as well. Um, FJ subs on oops is something that if you have a nice uh, serial port attached to your machine, that's, uh, you're recording the serial output and you hit a bug that lock crashes the machine, it will dump out the entire trace buffer once it hits it. Usually the first thing it does is it turns off tracing so it'll hopefully the tracing itself won't fill, you know, the debugging stuff won't uh, cause problems. So it turns off tracing and then does um, a dump and you can also call this, there, you can actually, if you have access to the code, you can actually could put in any situation or in any place just dump on oops or, or ftrace dump and dump the buffer or dump the trace buffer when you hit a path. Um, but if you set it on either the kernel command line or syscontrol in the proc file system, you can enable it so when you crash, the kernel crashes, it'll just dump the buffer and um, note if you do use this, you might want to shrink the ring buffers because by default the ring buffer is about 1.4 megabytes per CPU. No. And hmm? The problem is that if you, if you crash the kernel and you use F-trace dump and loop, you usually have to increase the buffer size because the, the interesting information is otherwise gone out of the re ring buffer. If really? you if you, so, if you debug complex problems where you need a lot of historic information to, to, to understand it, then that's where I end up often enough. Really? Yeah, the last one took me four hours to get out over serial. Okay, um, yeah, that's on interesting. A, on a big box. <laughs> yeah, I, I actually, yeah, I had, I was debugging a box with 240 CPUs and I didn't shrink the thing and I, I triggered it and it took a, over a day to finish the printout. <laughs> so uh, use it with your own caution here. Uh, another nice little utility, I know some people hate this, but actually if you get it working, it's awesome. And I've done a lot of debugging uh, customer sites this way, uh, especially since, uh, the company I used to work for, Red Hat, uh, has, has KXAC KDump working well. And uh, if you use KXAC KDump, and what it does is when the kernel crashes, it jumps into a pristine kernel that just basically records all the memory and creates a core dump like that GDB could read. And there's a utility called Crash. If you don't know about it, look it up. You know, GDB Crash Linux. Search it, find that utility. Um, it will allow, it's basically, um, a Linux kernel knowledgeable GDB. And when you load up the core uh, current or the core from there, uh, you could actually look at task structs, you could look at the, how the whole system state was when it crashed. Uh, Lee Seba, uh, no, um, Lai Jiang Sang, Lai, I, I'm probably butchering his name. Um, he, I think he was working for Hitachi at the time. I haven't seen him in a while, so he, I don't know where he is now. But uh, one day he asked me, Steve, uh, for your uh, trace command output file, trace.dat, do you have documentation on its format? And I said, yes. You install the trace command, you do make uh, install doc, and do man trace command dash dot. And actually, I have a man page that tells you how the format is. He said, thank you very much. A month later, I get CC'd on these patches that are being sent to the crash maintainer on a, tra a trace uh, mod or trace plugin for crash. And I have to fix it because I don't know if it's up to date right now. If it's not, please let me know. I, I will try to fix it up because it's dependent on kernel versions. And what this does is if you go into the GDB or crash, which looks like GDB, and you load the trace plugin, 
you could actually save, uh, do a trace dump, and what it does is it will actually read the uh, ftrace ring buffers and create a trace.dat file. It reads the event file formats, it reads everything, and now you actually could use trace command, kernel shark, and everything else to, just as if you had, had the trace saved at the time of the kernel crash. Um, and I've debugged several um, things remotely where we couldn't have access to the machine uh, and because they had proprietary uh, software that they're running on it, but they would run their software and the thing would crash and I just tell them, here, enable these trace points or trace functions, enable uh, function tracing or whatever, and they would give me the core dump, I'd run this, get the trace.dat file, analyze it, realize, oh, I should have turned this else, this el uh, something else on so I give them more information, went back and forth a few times and sure enough, I found the problem. Um, what's coming, there is histograms today, I'm not going to really talk about it, but what's coming is really cool histogram data, uh, where you could actually say um, inside the kernel, you could say I want this event and this event and um, get a histogram of how, uh, adding like timestamps as well. So you could look at the time, uh, get a histogram of how difference in time between two events occur. Um, it's like, say, sked wake up and uh, schedule, sked switch. And you can look at it and get the histogram of all the processes that uh, woke up and the, the time it took between them um, and a nice little spread out of the histogram. Actually, I shouldn't say all the processes. Usually you do it on one process. This way you can actually run, remember the wake up tracer, I said you can't really do it on a specific task. But with this, uh, with the histogram features that's coming, I mean, um, it'll probably, it's not going to make 415, it'll probably be in 416. Um, what? EBPF? Uh, no, it's uh, Tom Sanusi, he asked if it's EBPF. No, this is Tom Sanusi's work. And um, it's, very, it's very simple, because uh, they were talking about using EBPF, but that's kind of like uh, a little bit more complex to try to get that working. Um, you can do more with it. Um, I'm repeating what he's saying anyway. Uh, so yes, you can do more with eBPF, and actually that's coming up soon, but this is, this is one of the most common use cases for what we need, and to keep it simple, and it's not that difficult, um, a few, there's a few modifications that I didn't like that he did, that, that's why it's not going to be in 414 or 415, uh, because he's got to rewrite one section of his code, uh, so I'm looking at maybe 416 for it, uh, but it's going to be a lot more... Um, uh, flexible. It's making ftrace much more flexible for its use cases. Um, it's also one that you could create a synthetic event. This is how it's usually done. Whereas uh, the histograms work where you could, on a certain event, you could do um, how many times it was hit and you could look at, you could specify a field within an event and it will give you the histogram of the value of the field that you have and then you could, yeah. And um, uh, with the synthetic events, you could take two, two events, create histograms on both of them, and create a synth, uh, synthetic event uh, that connects the two, and then you could actually, that actually works as a trace point. So when something triggers that says, hey, this, this histogram I want to trigger because of this value works, uh, it, will, it will call a synthetic event, and you could pass in the, the information that you want as, a, as parameters, what you want sent to that event, and um, it will record it just like a, a normal event. And that synthetic event, you could do histograms on, you could add triggers to, everything that a normal event you could do with, you could do with a, synth a synthetic event. Uh, to do this, we needed variables. So now we actually have variables added to the uh, events. So when an event is triggered in, in the histogram, you could actually say, hey, I want to record the timestamp uh, at this event. And then reference that timestamp at the next event which gives you the latencies. But you can record anything you want. That's coming up. That, the code has been written. It's only, like I said, it'll probably be in um, uh, 4.16. Uh, another thing where it's being worked on um, is uh, the IQ and preempt disable events. So whenever a interrupts are disabled or um, uh, preemption is disabled, we'll actually create an event for that. It's dependent on lock depth. And yes, it will add overhead if you run it. So it's not going to be in any production machines, but for debugging purposes, um, it'll be there. Another thing that's coming is module init tracing. It's already partially there today. 
uh, you could actually say, right now you could actually say, I want to uh, trace the functions of the module when it gets loaded. So you could actually set aftrace filter, the set aftrace filter, you could say, I want this module, I want all the functions in this module to be traced as soon as it's loaded, even though it's not been loaded yet. So when you put it in there, it'll, rec it'll save it, and then when the module is loaded, it'll say, hey, here's the module that someone asked for, enable all the, the uh, functions in that module, and then trace it. And also on top of that, I now trace init, um, init calls, both the um, uh, boot up init, so if you enable function tracing, you can now trace init calls, and also um, module init functions. Uh, if anyone remembers the uh, bricking of the E1000E, that had to do with init functions being traced. Uh, if you want to know more details about that, see me afterwards. And also I have a code coming up, uh, just real quick, is between tracing of, uh, this is more on user space side, uh, between host and guest. So if you have a bunch of guests running and you want, I'm trying to work on getting trace command to be able to say, hey, enable uh, tracing among all these guests and the host, and then interleave all the, um, uh, what's called, all the events together. And that actually takes a little kernel changes, but not much. Now for the wish list, things I kind of want to happen, and for me would be awesome. Uh, the first foremost is uh, a zero overhead for preempt enabled. And it would actually allow for something like locked up or something possibly, I don't know what it could, but locked up has to be initialized earlier, but to have maybe locked up or something to be enabled on a production machine. Um, how, by using jump labels or something, you can't, you don't think it's there? Okay, he needs a mic. <laughs> He's got the mic. Just don't drop it. So, no, j jump labels are the wrong, wrong thing. Um, alternatives could maybe work. Um, you can do the trace points, you cannot do locked up. Locked up um, very heavily relies on prior state, so you can only enable yep. it when you know there are no locks held, which is well, basically never. Okay, so let's say, okay, so locked up probably not, but there's features that depend on locked up that I would like to enable, like statistics, the so, lock stack. So who was, I think Josh um, recently, or is, is, in a, is in the process of rewriting a bunch of the Powerverse IRQ crap stuff uh, into alternatives, um, because Powerverse, um, also has this thing. Um, so if you can hook on top of that, that would be awesome for the okay. interrupts. Thank uh, you. For preempt, I'm not sure. So preempt disable on x86 is a single deck instruction, I think. Right. Um, so maybe an alternative for that? Or maybe yeah, but you need to be uh, careful to, so to, to not increase text size too much. The call is what, seven bytes? And the deck has a- Five bytes. Five bytes. So yeah, that might work. Okay. But, uh, okay, yeah. so that's like, uh, that's like one of my wish list things. I would love to be able to trace or enable like uh, latency tracers, the, um, the preempt IRQ off latency tracer on a production machine. Yeah, so alternatives shouldn't be too hard to- Okay, work, so I use think. alternatives for that. Okay. Um, No, no, no. It, uh, alternative patching happens anytime your quantifier changes, which is typically the CPU capability bits, but it uh, can happen anytime. Yeah, and it used to, they don't do this anymore, but there was a time when uh, if you went, if you had, if you booted up a SMP box and you did, you know, CPU down all the way to one CPU, it would say, oh, we only have one CPU, we're a uni processor now, and it would actually no op out all the spin locks. <laughs> that used to be. They, they, but then they realized that caused too much problems and they got rid of that. <laughs> yeah, I think we still patch out uh, the lock prefix, but I'm not entirely sure, but. Do we? So did we drop that as well? Uh, we replaced the lock prefix with the DS prefix, I think. In, in the UP case? Yeah. But only, only at boot time. Oh, so yeah, so there's, certain, there's changes that were done at boot time, but I, when I first did this, when I first. At boot time, we did it. For some time to exercise that code, we did it on hot plug operations as well, but we do not longer do that. So it's a, it's boot time only thing. 
Okay. If yeah. you run a S&P kernel on a UP machine system, we patch out the lock instruction, uh, the lock prefixes. With a DS pair. Uh, With a DS pair. Okay. And but the thing why, is, you know, so why I guess would I remember? So actually, it was doing a runtime just to make sure it worked, to stress it out, because I remember seeing that. That actually shocked me when I went down to Uni Processor, or I shut everything down, and I saw everything change. I went, what, the ha what happened here? F-Trace actually noticed, uh, showed that to me. So I was just playing with F-Trace, and I saw all this stuff happening. And went, it freaked me out. But I was like, wow, this is kind of cool. Um, and that's what I said about the lock events. Uh, another thing I want is more interaction between eBPF and F-Trace uh, to be able to have and then maybe have histo uh, histograms um, hook into EPPF to make it even more powerful. Uh, have a simple case, and then when you want to add even more complexity to be able to hook with uh, EPPF. How, anyone here not know what EPPF is? A few people? Okay, it's okay. BPF is the Berkeley Packet Filter. Berkeley Packet Filter. You probably use it if you ever use NetFilter. Um, it was written um, for um, filtering of the network packets. And the EPPF is the extended Berkeley packet filter, which has made it more generic. Uh, it's a, a basically a virtual machine. It's a just-in-time compiler type of thing that goes into the kernel, that's in the kernel. So you can actually write programs and insert almost like a module, but it's made for small or specific thing. You can't, it's limited on what it can do uh, to prevent uh, problems, like you can't do loops. Um, there's certain kinds of things. It has a bunch of restrictions so that it can be ver uh, validated that it's not going to cause any issues with the kernel. But right now it works with perf. perf actually, you, you can actually write an eBPF program and modify uh, your traces in perf. I want the same functionality with ftrace as well. For, um, it shouldn't be too hard. Another thing I would love to have, and maybe eBPF could help on this, is the way of reading the function parameters. Um, so when you're tracing, I would love to see the arguments. It's not hard, but I could do a fixed set. The fact that there's no way to map a bunch of modules, I said, well, maybe what I could do is uh, have something that could figure out what functions do what and have it loaded, kind of like an EPPF program, but maybe a module or something that just loads and say, okay, map a bunch of uh, functions and say, when this function is triggered, record these, um, the parameters. Uh, the same thing with the function graph tracer, since it, does the re it traces the return call of a function, it would really be nice to know if that function it has a return code to see what that return code is. Um, function graph uh, needs a rewrite. Uh, it was written, um, you know, we got it working and great, but actually there's a lot of code in there that it has a lot of limitations. Uh, and it's one of the reasons why actually it's so slow. Um, it could be rewritten to be much uh, faster. And it really does need a rewrite. That's one of my wish lists. Um, Oh, another thing is I would love to be able to group sections and files. There's been so many times where I'm just like, I just want to trace what's in this file and not care about it. And usually what I do is I do a grep of functions or something and somehow pipe it in. It's really bothersome. And it really would be nice to say, everything in this file, I just enable this file to be traced. Of course, it's not going to be really too hard to implement that. The only issue is I don't want to bloat the kernel by putting a bunch of you know, metadata in. So I was thinking, is there a, I might do a way where make it into kind of a module. Uh, so you can say, hey, I want these sections, but it will be actually put in a module. So you can just load a module that will then map everything up together. So you only bloat the kernel if you want to use the feature. Um, or you could compile it in. I don't care. Um, so that's the possibility. That's one of my wish list things to do. Uh, one thing I, I'm hopefully going to get done is finally, this has been something that's been on my to-do list for a long time and it's been asked for, is to convert the trace command uh, output file to the common trace format. Uh, there's a common trace format utility for perf. Uh, what that is is like Matthew Denoy's, um, his LTTNG has like, uh, he worked on this way of having a way to read any trace data that he, like know that uh, you could have, um, if you convert everything to CTF, you should have all the utilities like kernel shark or trace command or whatever, and perf or whatever, should be able to read it, and LTTNG could read it, so you'll be able to see data from anywhere and everything should be able to correlate and to leave a bunch of different types of data and get a better picture of everything. Uh, one, of my, one thing I wanna work on is actually take the perf ring buffer and make it not so coupled with perf uh, and be able to maybe have ftrace, because that's a, F-trace was um, uh, optimized for uh, splice, 
displaced call. So everything was done by pages. It's great for sending over the network because uh, everything uh, has a zero copy for either writing to files or sending, to, sending packets off to the network or UDP. Uh, FT is really good at that. What it really sucks at is M mapping. Um, you can't really M map the ring buffer. You actually have to read the data from it. So if you're doing anything, you just want to stream stuff and not care about saving the data. F trace is weak on that. Perf is very is very very strong at that. Uh, but if I could decouple the perf, I don't want to write another ring buffer. I'd rather use what's there, and I kind of want to decouple the perf ring buffer. And that way, maybe we can have perf and F trace share a little bit better. Um, I still need to make trace event and trace command. Um, Libraries. Uh, we have a library that perf uses. Um, I think right now uh, there's perf, trace command, uh, power top, and the uh, machine check exception utility. I don't know what that's called. All use the same library, but they all have a copy of it. It's not anywhere. That, that's got to be changed. We got to have one copy. Am I talking too slow? Should I go faster? Uh, <laughs> I'm actually working very hard to talk slow. Am I talking slow? <laughs> Probably the slowest you ever heard me talk. Um, Kernel Shark. Uh, I have a full-time developer given to me. Uh, he'll be here next week. Uh, I'm trying to introduce him to the community. Uh, he's working on uh, Kernel Shark. Uh, the first thing we're doing is we're getting rid of GTK2 since it's not supported anymore. And I don't really feel like porting to GTK3 because I know when GTK4 comes out, I'm going to have to rewrite the code again anyway. So instead of doing that, we're going to go to Qt or Qt or whatever you call it. So he has it almost fully functional. So uh, right now, Kernel Shark will be Qt, uh, getting away from GTK. I want plugins to be able to modify Kernel Shark. Like one thing we want to do, uh, we already have working sort of, is um, uh, uh, we've asked was asked to do this. Like so, Zenomai. When Zenomai does schedule switches. Uh, to be able to see, have that as a schedule switch in Kernel Shark. And that code has already been written. It's almost done. It's almost out there. It hasn't been out yet. But um, to be able to add a plugin so you can actually change how Kernel Shark works. Um, I would like to, Kernel Shark to do other things than just showing what it, the way it does, but like flame graphs or any other. If you have ideas of like what you want Kernel Shark to do, to come see me. I would love to add more information. Uh, I would love it to read the histogram data. Oh, wait, I think I missed one thing. Oh, yeah, I missed the one thing. In case of the uh, uh, UU encode the uh, output for ftrace dump on oops, uh, I thought about doing something like that so that you could actually have an easy way to parse. Like if you do a dump and I just have a uh, save it to a file, I could say, hey, convert the ftrace dump on oops into a trace.dat file. Uh, so you have all the functionality of kernel shark and everything else on a tra ftrace dump on oops, if you don't have k exec k dump working. Um, so I've been asked, I never, I just use encode, I think it's the easiest way to parse and read stuff, but I've been asked uh, so many times by people who, because um, then I could just dump out data, the, the straight raw data and not parse it. Uh, I've been asked by a lot of people that would like, have, like can you take the trace dump on oops and make it into a trace dot dot file? And it's, you know, I don't want to be parsing events the way they are now, so doing that. Um, no, it, well, no, you could, it can, no, once you have, it's, it's a lot easier to do a lot more debugging once you have a trace.dat file. So if you could wait for the data to come out, it's a little bit faster for doing debugging. At least I know I, for me it is. You could do filtering, if you could say just ignore CPUs, you could do one CPU, three CPUs, and just. I can do this on the text file just fine. Yeah, yeah, well, not everyone is as expert to you as, as with said in awk as you are. <laughs> or grep, or whatever. Okay, anything else that anyone would like? Any things that you could think of that I haven't mentioned? I guess something going back to Peter's point, it's nice to take a trace of that file and be able to view it in Kernel Shark. You, like you want that? You like that? Or trace that what? Well, right. I'm just saying, like, if you did UU encode the data that gets dumped, and then you throw that in a trace of that file, and yep. you it on Kernel Shark. Yeah, so uh, what Julia just said was uh, you could, if we do get it into a trace.dat file, just so you can either have given the mic, but I'll repeat it. Uh, if you could get it, the trace, uh, this F trace dot, or F trace dump on oops, you have that, instead of what Peter's saying, well, text file is good enough, right? That's all I need. Well, some people would like to take that, convert it to a trace.dat file, and then you can run it on Kernel Shark and see a visual of everything that's going on as well, which you can't do really with text. I mean, you, and I don't want to go through and try to parse text because that's going to be a pain, but if I could do a trace, a UU encode, I can actually dump the binary data and then easily convert it to a trace like that. Yeah, 
I've never started Kernel Shark in my life. I wouldn't know what to do. Wait, so you're not my customer. <laughs> Anyone else would be interested in like a, like a, a dump from a ftrace dump on oops into a trace.dat file? I got one hand. So, ah, two. Do I hear three? <laughs> three, four. <laughs> Make it to an auction. So, I know this is always hard after lunch. <laughs> And I, I probably, you know, I was told to speak slower, which I probably shouldn't because, you know, after lunch, my speaking fast usually keeps people awake. Okay. But that's it. Thank you.